Hello, everybody. Uh, This is Anthony, your host and curator of All Things Strange and Unexplained. Uh, Welcome to the first official episode of my podcast, titled Not Another Horror Podcast. Now, you're probably wondering what exactly is this going to be about? Well, I have a love for all things strange weird, out of this world, you name it. So what better way to express my love for it than to make a podcast? Yeah, so that's what I did, like everybody else nowadays. <laughs> but this is neither here nor there. So you're probably wondering what exactly is the first case we're going to be talking about. Now, I should tell you to keep in mind that most of the stories that you will hear in this podcast will take place in the South because I am Southern. I am from the South. So (laughs) um, I'm more familiar with our urban legends and our folklore. But, you know, if you have the story anywhere in the world, just shoot me an email at notanotherhorrorpodcast at yahoo.com and we'll feature your story on upcoming episodes. Now, for the first case, we're going to be discussing something very weird and strange from my home state of Mississippi, the Pascagoula Phantom Barber. Now, you're probably wondering, one, what the hell am I talking about? And two, where the hell is Pascagoula? Well, one of those are a little bit easier to answer. Pascagoula is in southern Mississippi. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Pascagoula. In the early days of World War II, the warship construction helped this tiny fishing town of Pascagoula, Mississippi, grow from a population of 5,000 to nearly 15,000, seemingly overnight. Although a large population meant an economic boost for local businesses, it also meant the police force was struggling to keep the larger population in line. Aside from the expected uptick in drunken brawls and burglaries, there was one menace wandering the streets that kept people awake at night. And he was the Phantom Barber of Pascagoula. It all started on the night of June 15, 1942, when two young girls by the name of Mary Evelyn Bridges and Edna Marie Heidel at the Our Lady of Victory's Covenant woke up to a strange man crawling out of their window. The girls were terrified, I mean, rightly so. They had no idea who this man was or how he got into their room. But the following morning, each girl realized that a lock of their blonde hair was missing. Briggs later described the man as sort of short, sort of fat. And he was wearing a white sweatshirt. This was kept quiet by everyone in the Covenant, and they wrote it off as a one-off experience because they couldn't have the community thinking the Covenant wasn't safe. But little did they know, this would be the beginning of one of the oddest cases in Mississippi. Hello everyone out there, it's me, Anthony Rossetti, and I hope you're enjoying Not Another Horror Podcast. While we're on our break, let me take a quick second to tell you about our sponsor, Anchor. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which I love. You can use it right from your phone, iPad, or computer. 
Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great and you don't have to break the bank just to start your own podcast. They'll even distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and many more. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. So download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And again, that's anchor.fm. Let's get back to the show. Now the cases continued. The next one would happen on a Monday night on June 8th, 1942. The barber, he struck again. The victim would be another young girl by the name of Carol Pieti. Carol, who was six at the time, was in the bed asleep next to her twin brother, Jacob. The barber, he made a slit in the screen of the window and he came in. He came in and took a snip of little Carol's blonde locks. Carol, who was asleep, um, she started to come to because she heard something that sounded like the sound of scissors. When she finally sat up in the bed, the man was crawling out of the window. But little did the phantom barber know is that this would be his first mistake. Because on this night, he didn't realize that he had left a footprint. The next incident would occur on that following Friday night, when the home of Mr. and Mrs. Heidelberg was invaded. Like before, the window screen was cut and the invader came inside. But instead of taking his typical trophy lock, he used a heavy iron bar to attack the couple, taking out some of Mrs. Heidelberg's front teeth and knocking her husband unconscious. Unfortunately, it all happened so quickly that neither could describe their attacker. The police deputized six men and brought in bloodhounds to pick up a scent. The dogs followed the trail to a pair of blood-stained gloves in the nearby woods, but that was as far as they got. The police theorized that the assailant might have stashed a bicycle in the woods to make his escape, which, to me, sounds like a lot of work, but hey, you know. The final attack came on a Sunday night when the hair of Mrs. R. R. Taylor was cut. She said she had been woken up by something with a sickening smell passing over her nose. The next thing she remembered was waking up and getting violently ill. Police later determined the barber must have cut the window screen, stuck a chloroform soaked rag over Taylor's face, and then collected her lock of hair. For two more months, residents lived in fear that no additional barber attacks occurred after that one. Then suddenly, police announced they had caught the phantom barber. William Dolan, a 57-year-old chemist. Now, I don't know about you, but I think a chemist in 1942 would have better things to do than be a creepy barber, but hey, Stranger things have happened. Dolan has sparred with Mr. Heidelberg's father, a local magistrate over a legal issue. So it was thought he attacked the couple to seek revenge. Although this didn't directly tie him to the Phantom Barber invasions, police claimed a large bundle of human hair was found behind his home. The FBI later identified some of the hair and belonging to Carol Pieti. Now, despite his insistence of innocence, Dolan was quickly found guilty of attempted murder and sentenced to 10 years in prison. 
He was never charged with any crimes related to the actual hair snatching incidents, but in the eyes of the public, he was the phantom barber, case closed. Now, six years passed by, and Mississippi Governor Fielding Wright reviewed the case and asked that Dolan take a lie detector test. Upon passing, Dolan was given a limited suspended sentence and then eventually set free in 1951 as if nothing had happened. Now, in hindsight, some modern historians wonder if Dolan was guilty of any crime at all. He was arrested at a time when the public was in a state of panic and the police were desperate to close the Phantom Barber case. It would have been very easy to plant the hair during Dolan's arrest and then tamper with the evidence sent in to the FBI. In addition, Dolan was a known German sympathizer and considered a traitor by many townsfolk. So his arrest for the attack on the Heidelbergs was met with little resistance. Good riddance to bad rubbish, most of them probably thought. Was Dolan the phantom barber of Pascagoula? Or someone who took the fall to ease the anxieties of a small town? We may never actually know for sure, but we do have our theories. Theory 1. Dolan was framed by the actual mad barber himself. I mean, he might have had some vendetta against Dolan and wanted to see him gone, but that seems to be a lot of trouble to go through for someone that you supposedly hate. But then again, hate can make us do some crazy things. Trust me, I would know. <laughs> and of course, Theory 2. Dolan was a copycat and wanted to attack the Heidelbergs, who he notoriously despised and kind of thought it would be a better way to do it and not get caught because, I mean, people were already looking for the Phantom Barber, so why not cash in on this? What better way to get revenge than pretending to be him? But nothing about this case really makes sense. Why children? And then adults? Why hair? We may never actually know. But next time you're home alone, asleep, and hear a bump in the night, make sure those windows are locked. And that wraps up our first official episode. As always, I'm your host and curator of all things strange and unexplained, Anthony Rossetti. And if you want to hear more stories, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel, Not Another Horror Podcast. And you can also hit that button and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else you listen to your podcast. And if you want to hear your own story on the podcast... Shoot me an email at notanotherhorrorpodcast at yahoo.com. And until next week, stay safe, stay sane.